The People versus William Melendez. Today is the day of the jury trial. Your Honor, Robert Donaldson, occurring on behalf of the people, we're prepared to proceed. Carmen DeFranco, occurring on behalf of the people, Your Honor. And John Dallas, on behalf of the people. James Thomas, on behalf of William Melendez, Your Honor. Alex Brown, on behalf of William Melendez. Very good. We're going to begin with a bring jury out of court. I'm going to give you 20 minutes apiece to open the statement. And we're going to proceed straight to trial. We'll talk about the court of the to bring the jury out. All right, for the jury. Colton Persis, thank you. Colton Persis. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Please be seated. Society must have rules. The rules are utilized to ensure order. We entrust the police in large part to enforce those rules. We give them enormous power. We give them the power to take our freedom. We give them the power to take our lives. 
there are limits on that power. And that's why we're here today. A police officer cannot act in an arbitrary and capricious way. He can't be unreasonable in enforcing the law. And it is our position that William Melendez abused the power that we entrusted to him. Who decides what the rules are? Who decides? whether the power was used improperly. Not me. Not Mr. Thomas. Not the judge. You decide. And that's right and proper. That's why we're all here today. And that's a decision that you're going to have to make at the end of this case, is whether or not that power was abused. These events began uh, during the late evening hours of the 28th day of January of this year. Lloyd Dent was in his vehicle, a Cadillac, a shiny Cadillac, recently claimed according to him, and I think the photos will show as well. And you first see him in his car on Oakland Avenue in the city of Banks. He approaches the stop sign at John Daly. He stops at that stop sign with Mr. Melendez and his partner, Mr. Zilla Newsom, following behind. They follow him to the next stop sign, which I believe is Hill Avenue. And he does what's called a rolling stop. He hits his brakes, he slows down. But I think when you see the video, you'll conclude that he, he probably didn't come to a complete stop. So, <coughs> Mr. Melendez, uh, driving the vehicle, falls in behind him, turns on the lights, no siren. And about 40 seconds later, uh, Mr. Dent pulls over right outside the old Angster Police Department, where the lighting is good. And Mr. Melendez, <coughs> gets out of the car. So does his partner, John Zelenewski. Mr. Blondes comes out, gun drawn, and approaches the vehicle. As he approaches the vehicle, Mr. Dent opens the door. Melendez proceeds to go to the entry to the door, point his weapon at Mr. Dent. Mr. Zalanuski falls in very close behind, yanks him out of the car, Zalanuski does, throws him to the ground. Mr. Melendez proceeds to uh, jump on him, he's on all fours, put him in a chokehold, and within seconds, strikes him about 16 times in the head for no apparent reason. The struggle continues. Mr. Dent does nothing but try to defend himself. He doesn't strike, he doesn't kick, he doesn't do anything. You'll see it. There are three witnesses to the event that you're here to decide. One is Mr. Melendez, and he has the right not to testify. You've already been told about that. So we may or may not hear from him. That's his choice. You'll hear from his partner, who is a wannabe cop by the name of John Zelenewski. He is, quote, an auxiliary officer. <coughs> he has no official title. He does it for free. You'll hear from him. I think you'll conclude at the end of his testimony that he's a partisan, a cheerleader, a confidant of the defendant. You will hear from Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent has no criminal record, except he likes to drive around with 
his license suspended, so he's had a fair amount of issues with that. He's an older fellow. I hate that term because I think he's younger than me. But he's an older fellow. And he's been a factory worker his whole life. He ended up being beaten at the scene. He ended up being charged. The case was ultimately dismissed. And nobody from the Angster Police Department ever talked to him. Not for the three days he was in the hospital as a result of what happened to him. Not when the case was pending. Not even to today. You'll have an opportunity to see Mr. Dent. Uh, Mr. Dent is doesn't have some of the intellectual gifts that were bestowed on everyone else. He's small. He has a stammering problem. <coughs> His memory has been affected by the beating that he took. But you're going to hear from him. You're going to hear from him. I want to get into a little bit of lawyer talk now. I got to look at it. You guys had a rest to you. Uh, I want to back up a bit. These events were all captured on video. There's some audio in some places, but not all. And Mr. Dent sure is lucky that that's true. Because this would have been just any other case the police can understand and tell the story. But we've got the video. They say a picture <coughs> is worth a thousand words, but a video tells the story. And you're going to see it. And you're going to see the story. You're going to see the story, not only of the blows, but you're going to see the cavalry arrive that's summoned by uh, Mr. Zillman's partner. And you're going to see them come to his aid, even though he doesn't need any aid, he doesn't watch. And you're going to see that they hit him with tasers, they kick him. And when they're done, they celebrate. I anticipate that the defense isn't just going to sit there and, and uh, accept what I'm saying. I anticipate that the defense will be that somehow Mr. Dent deserved what he got. Because that's the only defense that they can have. And how might they do that? They might say he's a drug addict. They might say he was under the influence of drugs. You'll hear testimony that that's not true. I want you to listen very carefully, not only to my case, but theirs, and see if it passes the smell test. Mr. Dent will be victimized again here in court. I guarantee it. Now the water drop. You know, we go to law school, the judge did, I did, and Mr. Thomas did, and we learn how to talk a language that no one else understands. And you gotta learn how to speak English again. But you're going to have to learn how to speak lawyer talk a little bit. What do I mean when I say that? The judge is going to instruct you on the law. And remember, most of the laws are written by lawyers. You talk too much, 
these big words for simple concepts. So, what are the charges that you're going to have to decide in this case? I would start with the misconduct in office, if I were you. What is misconduct in office? You've got a copy of it, the judge wrote it to you. But what does it boil down to? Society has to have entrusted you with a responsibility. And you have to have violated that trust. You have to violate it through something called malfeasance and misfeasance, lawyer talk. Okay, what's malfeasance? Malfeasance is you can choose to do wrong, and you do. Misfeasance says you're allowed to do it, but you go over the line. And our allegation is he did just that. He went over the line. Police officers, of course, can use reasonable force. But there was nothing reasonable. The second charge that I think you should look at is assault by strangulation. What does that mean? Lawyers, of course, have defined that, too. But it's what you think. If you cut off someone's ability to breathe, and you're going to see, and you're going to hear that that happens. The third charge is called assault with intent to do great bodily harm. What does that mean? There's a law, law talk, but as far as I'm concerned, what you're really talking about is you are trying to mess somebody up. And in this case, he did. He put him in the hospital. <coughs> That's the law. That's the legal talk. You follow the judge's instructions because that's what the law requires, that I prove all the elements. But I'm trying to simplify it down to what I think is at its core. Listen to the judge on the law, not me. But I think you'll conclude that that's what's going on. When the proofs are concluded, I think that you're going to be focused on just one thing at the end of the day. Is what the defendant did reasonable? And was it reasonable as a response to the situation that presented him, was presented to him that night? A situation that he began and ended himself. And then proceeded to lie about it, I suspect, to you. You might hear about drugs coming out of the car. He's in the car twice before those drugs appear, the third time he goes. At the end of the day, I trust that you are going to conclude, based on the evidence that I present, that he abused the power that we have trusted. Thank you very much. Mr. Tom. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, as you can imagine, I have a different point of view in this case. As a criminal defense lawyer, I try and look at the evidence, I try and look into the evidence, see what it is that the evidence shows and try and point out a different point of view than what the prosecution has said. Recognize that what I say to you today, what we were doing actually when we were bargaining for a jury, that's not evidence. And certainly what the prosecutor has said here in his argument, in his opening statement, is not evidence as well. I ask this, that you pay attention to the evidence. I ask that you look at my cross-examination and see, ask the question of yourself, where, what is it that he's trying to show? What is it that he's asking this question for? As you listen to the answer. And then take into consideration that when you go back to the jury room. The prosecution says that police officers are entrusted with a duty and an obligation. We embrace that. Tough job to be a cop today in Inkster. Tough job to be a cop anywhere. They wear flak vests for a reason. It's dangerous out there and Inkster is a dangerous city. We expect the proofs to show that on the day in question, on the 28th of January, 
that Officer Melendez was ordered to go out to that particular area that he was because it was a high crime area, because drugs were being sold, because people had weapons, because there was prostitution on the street, and set up a surveillance. We intend to show that that surveillance was conducted and that there were movements of the vehicle that were consistent with what it is that ultimately occurred, and that is the stop of Mr. Dent's vehicle. You're going to hear testimony from Officer Zelenowski, who was in the car at the time, who's going to relate what happened. You're going to see the video, and it's an interesting thing. What is a video? It is a reflection of what the camera saw. There may be a different point of view of what the video shows. And I suggest to you in my cross-examination and in the things that I am going to pre present in, 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 in the representation of my client, that you might see a different view of what happened. And that is that Dent went to the budget in. that the surveillance changed as time went on to get into position to catch him coming out of there after he was there for a short period of time. We are asking you to reasonably infer that he was there for a short time because he went to get drugs. Drugs that he had in his urine at the hospital that he denied to everybody and that the prosecution still to this day doesn't get. and that he had cocaine on him, six grams of cocaine that was ultimately found in the car. As you see, I have a different point of view. I'm asking you to hold on now in this case. Not rush to judgment either by the opening statement of my worthy adversary here or mine. I want you to keep an open mind and listen to the evidence as it comes through. But when we start to talk about choices, when you're in a high crime area, and there is a potential that somebody is going to be armed, and a person doesn't stop his car when he's supposed to, what would you, in your mind, think? We believe the proofs are going to show that Mr. Dent knew he was driving on a suspended driver's license, he knew he was holding dope, and he wasn't going to stop. He drove erratically, you'll see it in the video. He didn't stop, he blew a stop sign, caused danger to other people. Car, he almost hits a car in the middle of the street when he doesn't stop. And when the door is open, he flings it open violently. And then what does he do? Does he get out of the car? No, he does not. You'll see from the video, and we intend to show, that his gesture to this, to the right, was a gesture that could be taken by either Zielinowski or Officer Melendez as either an attempt to hide evidence, which was ultimately found on the right-hand side, or reach for a weapon, which if you're out on the street, you'll want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, you're going to hear about justification. You heard about it in my voir dire. You're going to hear about the use of force continuum which means that you are justified as a police officer in using force. You know that police officers have the right to arrest, they have the right to handcuff, they have the right to strike somebody that strikes at them or has the potential for doing that. They even have the right to kill if they feel that their body hit or someone else is in harm. Justification. There is a use of force continuum. You're going to hear from Dr. Aaron Westrick about that. What is the use of force continuum? That is that a police officer can reasonably act upon what it is that he sees, what it is that he feels, what it is that he ha is experiencing at the time, and step up the use of force. In this instance, Mr. Dent was pulled out of the car and went to the ground. A 57-year-old man struggled for two minutes, approximately. He was kicking. You'll hear testimony from the police officers to the effect that that was occurring. He was trying to get up on two occasions, lifted up three guys at that time. 
but still was pulled down. He had his left hand, he was asked to submit, and he would not. Why? I'll ask you the question and you decide why. Was it because of the fact that he was being arrested and he didn't want to be arrested? Was it because of the fact that he said, leave me alone, before he got out of the car, he yelled and screamed it and then said he would kill? Was it because of the fact that he didn't want to be arrested again for driving on a suspended license? And he knew that if he was arrested, that the car would be taken in, and the car would be searched, and there would be cocaine found in the car. You decide. You decide. But when you're looking at that brief video that the prosecution is going to show you, I want you to see all that came before that in the surveillance. And then make a decision as to what it was that Mr. Dent was up to. Victim or not. Victim or not. We have to judge what it was that he was out there doing. You're going to see Officer Melendez, not in one second, as the prosecutor said to you in his opening statement, 4.4 seconds, which they're going to slow down for you so that it extends it over a longer period of time. 4.4 seconds. He, Mr. Dent is getting hit in the head for, a period, for approximately 16 blows. Some with his hat on, some with it off. During that entire time, he's struggling. But what I want you to see in the video, what I want you to look for in the video, is what happens after Officer Melendez stops. Does Dent submit? He hadn't submitted for that amount of time. He didn't submit to putting his hands behind his back, which is all that was necessary for him. He continued to struggle even after that. He had to be tased once, didn't work twice, didn't work three times. It was on the third that finally a second officer who came to get his arm that he was struggling with was able to get it behind his back. That's not passive resistance. That's active resistance, and you have to ask the question, what happens when somebody gets up and runs away, gets in a car and runs away at high speed, gets in a car and goes through intersections after that, gets to some object that he might hurt the officers or some other person. Now, strangulation you're going to hear about. We talked about it a little bit in voir dire. Okay. You decide whether or not he was strangled. You don't see him pass out. You don't even see him winded when he gets picked up. After a minute and 48 second struggle, he goes to the hospital and doesn't complain about any neck injury or the fact that he was, that he was choked out. You decide whether or not there was strangulation or whether or not it was a head hold meant to control him as best they could so the other officer could put his handcuffs on. Prosecutor wants to empower you. I do too. I recognize the power of a jury, and that is that you have the right to look at the evidence based on your experience in life. You weren't brought here because you're all the same. You weren't asked to be jurors so that you could just rotely say what it is that I ask or the prosecutor. I'm asking you to take and use your 21 plus years of experience. Not look at this case with blinders on it. Take a look at the whole case to make a determination as to what was reasonable under the circumstances. What was the justification for the actions by the police officer? And how it is or why it is that we ended up here? And it's not because of a fist bump. <coughs> Let's make the facts fit the case. Whether it's misconduct in office, whether it's assault with intent to do great bodily harm, or whether or not it's strangulation. At the end of this case, I'll have a lot more to say about it. And then I'll get to argue instead of just tell you what it is that I expect the proofs to be. And hopefully it will track with what your verdict will be, which I'm asking for at the end, will be a not guilty verdict. Thank you. I'll stand up and take a stretch break.